Yeah, can we afford to be optimistic these days? I'm Jay Fidel's One O'Clock Block, and uh, our our host uh, in a variety of shows, Dan Figleaf, a retired three-star Air Force and a member of our board, is here to help me mm, decide whether we should be worried and what we should be worried about. Welcome to the show, Dan. Aloha, Jay. Good to see you. Always good to be part of the, the think tech Ohana of citizen journalists. There you go. You are you are that for sure. So um, I want to start with something that is uh, you know inescapable, and that is I was I was looking at our Entra Act a little while ago, and you were there touting your regular uh, Figment show, and uh, you, you mentioned that I knew already that you had been a fighter pilot for years and years, and and right now I think um, you know if you follow the news, uh, uh, jet fighters are in the news. They're central in my view, right. central in the news. And, and uh, I know you have thoughts about the, the Polish MiG-29s and how to deploy them or not, and uh, what, what good policy sounds like when you're trying to um, approach um, a no-fly zone. Yeah, I have thoughts about both topics, Jay, the, the having enforced a no-fly zone, north and south uh, over Iraq, and uh, thinking about the MiG-29s, I have the same thought on both topics, and that thought is shut up. Why we have brought this into the public sphere it absolutely escapes me. This is a sensitive time, sensitive issue. It should not be at every podium in Washington, D.C., or anywhere else. And I'm, I'm highly irritated by the public nature of our addressing these two sensitive issues. Well, that's part of uh, the president's thing these days about telling you what he knows about um, Vladimir Putin, what he anticipates from Vladimir yeah. Putin. And you know, from some points of view, it seems interesting that um, you know, he takes the wind out of Putin's sails maybe uh, by predicting based on intelligence what Putin may do. Although yeah, I'm not against that at all, Jay. That, uh, there's some of that that I like, but when we're talking about what we're going to do, mm -hmm. uh, sure less. You know, you don't have to show a picture of your breakfast on Facebook. Well, let me take a peek at your breakfast for a minute. No. Um, I'll tell you my <laughs> thoughts, and you can, you can tell me that I, I shouldn't even yeah. ask you, but um, it seems to me that uh, the no-fly zone is really important. I had a couple of thoughts. One is that <clears throat> here's Vladimir Volinsky. He's the president. And there's a functioning government, a democracy, if you will, in Ukraine. They're under attack, but there's a functioning democracy, and he's the president. Then he says, can I, can I get a little help from you guys? Uh, you it's go. my airspace. I own that airspace legally under any international law analysis. It's mine. Uh, so come on over um, or give us your planes, whatever it may be. And it, it seems to me that uh, there's no real answer, that Vladimir Putin cannot really answer that. He's the invader. He's not entitled to say it's not your airspace. Um, it is uh, it is Ukraine airspace. So from that point of view alone, it seems to me that any country that wants to help can help. Um, it's the way it works. The yeah, other, not, the other thing. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, not quite that simple, um, because in Iraq, as we enforce the southern and northern no-fly zones, those were. Um, legitimized by UN Security Council resolutions. And, and so the coalitions that enforced the two no-fly zones had the uh, legitimacy of the United Nations. And right now, we won't have that legitimacy because the acting chair, the temporary chair of the UN Security Council is, help me out, Jay, pretty sure it's Russia. Yeah, I'm really, really concerned about um, the collapse of United Nations credibility with regard to uh, Ukraine. But e having said that, a no-fly zone isn't that simple. And you can't just say, I want the entire world to enforce my no-fly zone. Um, again, if, if I were Todd Walters, the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, who's a great guy, worked for me uh, back when I was a two-star, I think. Um, I'd be doing a lot of things behind the scenes. I wouldn't be doing anything in front of the scenes. You know, the distinction, and, and at first I thought there was something to it, but now I don't, uh, was um, that uh, um, the U.S. policy, as announced, perhaps they shouldn't have announced it, um, was, um, okay, you know, if you want to fly these jets out of um, a NATO base, 
you know, fly these jets into Ukraine for Ukrainian pilots to use there out of Ukraine, out of a uh, Polish NATO base. You can do that, but you can't fly them out of Ramstein, which is a NATO, also a NATO base, happens to be in Germany, not Poland. Is there really a, a legitimate difference between those two approaches? I don't know if there is or not. I do know that I would not debate it in the court of public opinion and press conferences. <laughs> there probably was a way a week or two ago to um, bring that capability to the Ukrainians um, and, and maybe a way to do quietly a no-fly zone where the, the only notice of its enforcement was a fireball that used to be a Soviet, uh, sorry, there was a, there was a Freudian slip, a Russian aircraft. Um, but once you put it into the public sphere, you just, you lose the ability to do it right. Ain't that the truth, <clears throat> especially with a guy like Putin, you know, who is uh, playing, you know, to the audience that he's got it on the line and um, he's, he's not going to let go. And it's, it's macho. It's something along those lines. And, and, and Jay, if I could, you know, there's a, a direct historical precedent that I don't think anybody else has brought up during the Korean War. Um, once we got F-86s over to Korea and uh, the, the North Koreans responded with MiG-15s. It's not quite in that sequence, but Russian and Chinese pilots operated from Chinese airfields near Dandong. There were as many as 400 MiG-15s operating off, believe it or not, dirt airfields, Zinni, Jube, et cetera. And they were flown by Russian pilots. We knew they were flown by Russian pilots uh, deep on the classified side. And the American pilots had a sense of that. Soviet marked MiGs, et cetera. And they operated with mostly sanctuary from North Korea. This has been done before. If we'd been a little more imaginative, we could have made things significantly more difficult for Putin's Air Force. I totally agree. <clears throat> and I and I feel that uh, maybe that moment has been lost, yes, but it absolutely. was available to us at the outset. Mm -hmm. All we had to do was just take action and not talk yeah. about our aspirations or plans. That's a yeah. basic rule of of the military, isn't it? Well, I think it should be. And um, as you said, I, I I like throwing Putin's stuff on the table and and the revelations that we could have hoped would deter him about their plans for false flag operations and other things. But I don't, I don't want to give him any hint of what I'm thinking as a potential adversary. Sure. And that's what he, On the military side, diplomatically different, right? Sure. Right. And there should be a separation. Yeah. You know, there, you know, there is something ultimately in war and violence that you have to keep your plans close to your chest. So, um, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, you are an extraordinary person in the sense that you have been in the fighter cockpit, but you have also been responsible for enormous, um, you know, resources, um, troops, and person and uh, personnel, and 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 uh, material and commands, hither and yon, and so uh, over a long career. And you know, I I want to ask you, um, you so by virtue of that. You have been defending the country for most of your life, mm -hmm. um, but you have also been defending the liberal world order. That is um, to protect people one way or another uh, from um, dictators who would gobble them up. Um, and I, you know, and I'm sure that you you have been faithful to both over the years I hope so. and thought about both. It's not just the U.S. Mm -hmm. It's the world order. Um, we can't afford to have another third world war, another world war. Jack, yeah, um, that's a, a really striking sort of a question or hypothesis. Uh, I didn't really defend our country. I defended because it's what the oath says, the Constitution of the United States, the ideals, the foundational ideals of the country, and therefore defended the foundational ideals that should make a uh, free and open, as the current phrase is, world with a with a rules based uh, order, 
and I think we're still doing that. And what what can what should concern us is the erosion of rules as exemplified by the Russian incursion in Ukraine and in Ukraine. And I think elsewhere there are some uh, erosion of rules. The the agreement between uh, Putin and Xi is kind of a let's rewrite the rules agreement. Now, I don't think this will work out well because things aren't going well for, for Putin and thus it will reflect badly on Xi, but uh, the rewriting of these rules is of great concern because our ideals in the United States of America are not a perfect solution and they ought not be foist on every other country, but they are an exemplar. And when applied well and governed well, should be something that the world aspires to, not to be like us, but to have liberty as we do. I, I have come to feel that the liberal world order that was um, put in place at the time of the Marshall Plan mm -hmm. uh, and well done uh, in 1945, 46, 47 um, has, has deteriorated. And there's, there's a million factors about that. But you've been uh, in the mm -hmm. service. You've seen this from the military side of things, from the liberal world order side of things for all these years. Right. And I wonder, I wonder if you would agree with me that the that there has been a deterioration globally uh, in this notion of respecting your neighbor and your neighbor's sovereignty. Um, yes, but I look more internally. Uh, uh, well, I guess I look internally as well, not just at in, in impositions on sovereignty or. Um, yeah, on sovereignty, let's say that's a, that's a pretty fraught with the uh, complexity term, but also internally, uh, for example, I'm really appalled at what happened in Canada, not because I support the truckers, but the use of the Emergencies Act. I don't think any, his, any after the fact analysis will say that that met the criteria and that things that were done were, were appropriate. Um, uh, and so it's it's an overall application of authoritarianism, whether it's in inside your borders or beyond that. Uh, and every every one matters, Jay. That's what I think I've learned in my travels to seventy two countries and working with the leaders of military and civilian of every country in Asia Pacific, except for North Korea, so far, maybe someday is that every country matters. So the, the one that bothers me the most right now isn't Ukraine, uh, Russia, or China, Taiwan, that worries me. But, you know, I'm, I'm deeply saddened by, um, by Myanmar and what happened there because there was so much potential for the evolution of a uh, liberal nation, not in, in, not in a in a political party sense, but with broader uh, rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in, in the right context. That, damn it, we lost a lot there when, when that went south. And we lose something every time there's an erosion of an individual right. life. Yeah. An individual life. So what? So what's the role of the United States? Uh, what's the role of the military um, to you know to deal with uh, things like that? I mean, it, to me, I'm not adverse to the notion of the world's policeman. I think the world needs a policeman, and I think the United Nations. You alluded to this earlier. Um, mm -hmm. Has shown its frailty, increasingly yeah. so. So mm -hmm. if it's not the United Nations. Uh, it's not the United States, and some people would like it not to be the United States, uh, then there's nobody. And, you know, take the human condition, the condition of the species as a social, perhaps an antisocial yeah. animal sometimes, and you have chaos. <laughs> so is the United States the one to step up and, and be the world's policeman? Uh, wouldn't that be better than having no world's policeman? So let me rephrase that question in a way that will inflame some and say, are we an exceptional, exceptional nation? Well, yeah, we are. That doesn't make us a better nation. We're deeply more, deeply blessed by 
where and when we were founded and you know imperfectly founded but with a lot of isolation a lot of resources and um, based on a set of ideals expressed in the constitution truly a unique little petri dish right and we got lucky and because we got so lucky and built an imperfect but much better democracy who else who else is gonna and it's not it isn't just the military but but the military is a key proponent or a key element in not spreading the gospel according to the United States, but sharing in our exemplar of how we treat people. And the Peace Corps is, is another element. Everything we do overseas, but I became the, I'm rambling because I have so many things in my head that we can do right and do do right. And I got to US Pacific Command as the deputy in October, 2005. So 10 months-ish after the Boxing Day tsunami and have been involved in the Pacific ever since. And I, I would submit that most of what has gone right for the United States came out of the exemplar of our relief efforts following the earthquake tsunami. Sure, uh, and it, that's part we of our role. As we are, and Jay, I've got a great story for that. If you have a, if you'll grant me 30 seconds. Uh, granted, granted, General. <laughs> okay. So this is a longer story than this, but in uh, our first military to military engagement with the Vietnamese, we had a very difficult set of discussions with the Vietnamese two star. I did personally. Okay, let's call it an argument. This is a longer and better story. But after that, he went back to his quarters here in Honolulu and had a heart attack and nearly died that night. They rushed him to Tripler Army Medical Center, cracked his chest open, did a quadruple bypass. And he was left in the enemy's hospital, if you will. This is in 2005 or six. He didn't speak a word of English. So, and he was going to have to pay for his medical care, which was gonna leave him and his family destitute in perpetuity. What did we do? Admiral Fallon and I went and visited him. We put a translator, most of the credit goes to Admiral Fox Fallon. At his bedside, we brought him flowers, brought him picture books. And then there were two really extraordinary things. Admiral Fallon um, convinced the State Department to pay his medical bills and got him a U.S. military medical evacuation airplane to fly him back to Vietnam. He went from being, I'm going to say this because I've said it many times, a commie rat bastard to a proponent, and, and somebody who understood the nature of our country. And Vietnam, by the way, is still a communist country, but we have tremendous links. And a lot of them go back to that visibility of how we are as a people and as a democracy. And so that when the military is engaged, they get that window into our soul. And I still believe we have a good soul. We gotta be aware of how people see us. You know, maybe not in one instance or for one day, but over time. Yep. Um, and I'm thinking of various places where American troops have been stationed and they made a mess of it. Uh, raping the women, what have you, getting in crimes on Saturday night, that sort of thing. And, and, and over time, that really corrodes us. I'm also thinking, however, that in my lifetime anyway, I've seen the military become foreign service agents, foreign service representatives, uh, diplomats. Mm -hmm. um, the, the notion of the military diplomat has emerged. I'm sure you've seen that too over the past 20, 30 years. And, uh, you know, it's not a burden of, 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 it's not a burden to be concerned about. It's something that the military can easily do um, and should do. It's not the same as war, not the same as fisticuffs but it's an example of soft power uh, or it's in a corollary of soft power. I'm thinking soft power is what you're talking about with this you know, communist pinko mm -hmm. person. Um, and soft power is, should be the way it works. Joseph S. Nye, the Kennedy School, smart power, soft power, all of that. And we know about that. But somewhere along the line, I think it, I think it has declined. I'll tell you, there was an article this morning um, forget the, the journal. It was an important article, though. Uh, Washington Post. Uh, 
And it, it, was, it, it was an examination of the countries that did not support the condemnation of Russia in the General <laughs> Assembly a few days ago. And there were at least 50 of them. Um, and who are those countries? Well, a lot of them are in Africa, a lot of them are in uh, Latin America, and they have relations with Russia. And they were quoted in the article as saying, we like Russia. Russia has been good to us. Uh, we feel that Russia has earned our respect, our ad admiration, our loyalty, and we're going to stick with Russia, even if Russia does this kind of war crime. And I, and I thought that was really extraordinary. And what it mm. means to me, I'm interested in what it means to you. What it means to me is we haven't been watching the store. We haven't been using that soft power in those continents, in those countries. And we really have to get back to doing exactly what you were talking about. Yeah, I... First of all, I don't like the term soft power because it makes it sound easy. You know, hard power is hard, soft power is soft. It's really difficult. It's more in terms of, of, of applying it effectively. I like to say four is easy. I fought some wars. And making the decision to go to war in the actual execution is a lot easier than peace. But I agree, we need to, um, at the same time, we counter. Uh, the military challenges, whether they're in Europe or Asia or anywhere else, look for opportunities to uh, to apply, okay, I give up soft power. The best opportunities we have to do that are in humanitarian assistance and disaster response. And there's a cost to that. And you know you can ask, well, what about the people suffering back here at home? Yeah. True, but it's so important. It's such an important investment in providing an example to the world and, and really to providing an example to our servicemen and women. Um, what, what is expected of this great democracy? Yeah, so it's not only being the world's policeman. No, oh it's no. Being, it's being uh, the world's yeah. um, sa savior. I'm not, that's too part of word, but the world's- no, we, Yeah, uh, the world's trier. We try, at least we try, we screw yeah. things up. And I was yeah. in Okinawa for four years, stationed in Okinawa. And I know the sensitivities, but I also know what that by and large, the US service members overseas represent their country extraordinarily well. Doesn't minimize the bad things that happen because bad things happen. But yeah, we, we should be the world's Shining light. Okay, that's not a political statement. No, no. But, so there's the city should. on the hill. Yeah. We should have the highest moral standards. Um, and expectations. Fair-minded, you know, and kind, and help people in need, and and um, you know, be be big brother. I guess you would say in a case where somebody was being a bully. Um, and we haven't. I haven't. You know, I haven't seen us doing that. Uh, I th I think um, you know uh, Joe Biden is doing a great job in trying to repair our relationship yeah. with the EU and NATO, this is great. Um, I disagree, I, I, I will tell you, I have to say that I, I'm, I'm, this is not a political statement, but I am stunned by the significant um, ineffectiveness of the Biden administration, I'd say incompetence, but not on a political sense, not in a political sense. I understand sense. that, but what, what, what are you referring yeah. to? I'm referring to their inability to enact their agenda. Afghanistan, big, my bit most popular uh, figments was about Afghanistan and failure to hold economy. The economy, and we see that at the pump and elsewhere. The Marie Antoinette moments of saying, hey, can't afford gas, buy a Tesla. But, um, the engagement with China, and there's too, not enough time to do that. So I... I, I don't think they're doing very well in terms of governing. And by the way, like most of the other governments, we still don't have a budget. So I want every government that's elect, duly elected to succeed. And I don't feel like the Biden administration is succeeding very, very much. Well, so we're talking, we're here to talk about concerns, okay? Yeah, that's, my, I'll, big, I'll tell that's you, my big concern. That's your big concern, yeah. but I mean, where does it go? My, my concern, I have two concerns. I have concerns domestically, that we haven't mm -hmm. solved these problems, the problems that everybody's focused on before, uh, 
Ukraine. And, uh, and we, we, you know, we're not really all that effective in terms of dealing with the Ukraine crisis either. So, uh, and people, you know, dying by the thousands every day. So I'm saying, hmm, I have concerns about both ends of that. And, uh, and ultimately, I have concerns about the influence of the United States, um, its role in the world in protecting the liberal world order, we've talked about that, but also about its ability to carry on and function as, a, as, a, as the democracy you talk about, the city on the yeah. hill. And I, I'd like to know if you have concerns about those things um, where the United States actually falls off the precipice and is no longer the country we want it to be um, and no longer has the influence or the internal ability to govern itself. I do have concerns um, that I, I think that the, but I, but I also know that our democracy's performance has, has been pretty cyclical since it started the 19th century. Sometimes we do really well, usually when we're forced to do really well as a democracy. And sometimes we have this partisan divide, acrimonious stuff that we're mired in right now. So um, I think the foundation is still there in, um, in the constitution and the other elements that that uh, are the framework of our democracy um, but we'll see you know one of the things that concerns me too and uh, i guess different people in different places different roles in the country different positions um, official positions not official business media whatever your life is um have different mm, opportunities but um i feel that Although we here on Think Tech, we can speak about these things. So there's a tremendous okay. value yeah. in having some kind of platform where you can actually open yeah. your mouth and, and express opinions, report facts, whatever, or a combination of the two. And, and my question to you is the ordinary stunk who's walking down the street. He probably feels, I'm sure he feels, there's nothing he can do, that this isn't his it, it, it's not his solution and therefore it's not his problem. Uh, he may be ultimately yeah. touched. He may not see that it's coming his way, but, but, he, but he feels at the end of the day, there's nothing he can do no matter what. And, and my question to you here in the last couple of minutes of our show is what can he do? What's your advice? Make make yeah. the whole country your command, okay? Um, and Ooh. and speak, <laughs> that's a, that'd be a job, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and speak to them and tell them uh, what they should be thinking about this and what they can do to put the the train on the track. Well, the uh, first of all, that's a big job you just gave me, Jay. Um, the the first thing I'd say is vote, because that is the core of your power and vote thoughtfully and don't, yeah, vote. So start with that. And secondly, um, even though I, my optimism is waning these days, have some faith, have some faith in the history of our democracy. And for me, faith in God matters. Um, so if that works for you, let that work for you, but have some faith. These are not the worst times our country has ever seen, folks. You know, that's not a suck it up buttercup statement. It's a, these are not the worst times we've seen. So take charge of it. Um, and ask yourself about what you're letting the government do for you because your loss of power comes often from a relinquishment of power or because of how you vote or how you acquiesce to government overreach. And that's, again, not related to political party. Um, take charge of your life and of your destiny. It's not going to be easy over the next couple of years, but it's not going to be as difficult as it has been at other times. Hmm. I think we have to have, yeah, have uh, Go ahead. I, I, I have, have a, to... one more message for you. Okay. And, and I, I, because you've taught me to look up at the clock and we talked about this ahead of time as a, Think that coach, man, host, man I, I'm looking at the clock and trying to, to uh, meet the standards. So time matters. And Jay, I just want to say happy birthday because I happen to know that you've had a significant round number birthday. 
And at the same time, on behalf of everybody on the Think Tech host panel and, and the board and the people who follow the 30 plus shows a week, thank you for the energy you put into this endeavor because you are making a difference and you're giving not just a citizen journalist a voice, but through us, I think you're giving those folks who feel a little hopeless a voice too. So I'm very grateful to be part of this and thankful for your leadership. I'm gonna leave it right there, Fig, but thank you very <laughs> much for those kind, kind words. And thank you for coming on the show and discussing this. And I was, was gonna say, we have to do it again. We have to explore this yeah, because dude. obviously it's a, it, it's a moving target. Who can I say that? It it's is. a moving target. The moving targets are hard to hit. I've done it in <laughs> combat. I know. It's hard to do. Thank you, General Dan Fig. We appreciate you coming on. Aloha. My pleasure, G. Aloha. 